Many folks are confused by 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 1 through 3. They have no idea what to do with this passage. Many others are convinced that the passage is a strong proof that the church is going to go through the tribulation. And yet still others think that it teaches a pre-tribulation rapture. So who is correct? If you want a clear understanding of this passage, stay tuned. Hi there, I'm Lee Brainerd and welcome to Soothkeep and another edition of Prophecy in the Crucible. My mission is truth, truth at any cost, truth above every other consideration. Now those who frequently watch my channel know that this pursuit of truth has a special focus on doctrinal and technical matters that pertain to the prophetic arena. And that's where we're going to go today. Today our topic is 2 Thessalonians 2, 1-3, and we're going to focus primarily on the grammatical structure of this passage. How should this passage be translated? Let's start by reading the passage in the King James Bible. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter is from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition." Now, there's two basic translation patterns that you're going to run into in the contemporary Bible versions. The first pattern is represented by the King James Bible. And this pattern runs like this. We beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. This translation pattern distinguishes between the coming slash gathering, which is the rapture, and the day of the Lord. The second pattern, for which we'll give an example from the NASB and the New King James Bible, runs like this. The NASB says, We request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord. And the New King James Version says, We ask you, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. These translations imply that the coming slash gathering, that is the rapture, and the day of the Lord are one and the same event. Now there's two basic interpretation patterns that largely follow, but not entirely follow, the two translation patterns. The first pattern distinguishes the rapture and the day of the Lord. This pattern we can represent with the following paraphrase. We plead with you on account of the rapture not to worry about the day of the Lord. In this understanding, that day in verse 3 refers back to the day of Christ slash the day of the Lord in verse 2, but it does not refer back to the rapture in verse 1. Now the King James translation readily lends itself to this interpretation because the translation essentially demands it. However, there are those who use the New King James Bible or the NESB or the ESV who come to the same kind of interpretation pattern, though their translation is not entirely friendly to it. Now the second interpretation pattern equates the rapture and the day of the Lord. We can represent this uh, interpretation pattern with the following paraphrase. We plead with you concerning the rapture to let us straighten you out on that day. Another paraphrase could be, let us teach you about the rapture, so you won't misunderstand that day. Now, there are actually some translations that bring this out very clearly. For instance, the New Living Translation says, let us clarify some things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and how we will be gathered to meet him. In other words, let us clarify how and when the rapture will happen. 
in this translate or pardon me in this interpretation pattern that day in verse 3 refers back to both day of Christ day of the Lord in verse 2 and the rapture in verse 1 in fact this is exactly the approach that the touted seven pre-trib problems video takes in minute 55 to 56 well let's take a closer examination of the King James Bible we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord and our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken, is that the day of the Lord is at hand. This is a straightforward petition with two parts. Not only do we have a verb of petition, which here is beseech, but we have a request, and we have the ground of the request. The request is that ye be not soon shaken. The ground of the request is by the coming of the Lord and our gathering together to him. Again, if we paraphrase this passage, we have, we are going to meet the Lord in the clouds, so don't fear that the day of the Lord could well break on your head. This translation, in fact, this interpretation clearly distinguishes the rapture and the day of the Lord. In this translation, the second half of verse 2 and all of verse 3 pertains to the day of the Lord, not the rapture. Now, let's take a closer examination of the NASB. And there we read, We request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord and our gathering together to him, that you be not quickly shaken to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. This translation mars the two-part petition. It basically blends the two parts into one mongrel petition. We can represent this petition with the paraphrase, we ask you not to be shaken about the rapture, thinking that that day has come. The request is simply, don't be shaken about the rapture, thinking it has come. The ground of the request is absent without leave. It's gone. It's AWOL. Now, this translation equates the rapture in the day of the Lord. In this translation, the second half of verse 2 and all of verse 3 is commentary explaining the circumstances of the rapture. So, which of these translation and interpretation patterns is correct? We can do no better than to actually dig into the Greek usage and determine the correct handling. The fact is, we want to get our eschatology from the Greek. We do not want to get our Greek from our eschatology. And there's three aspects of the Greek in this passage that we need to understand. The first one is that the verb is a verb of request. The verb is erotau. This is not a verb of education or telling. This is very important to point out and very important to take into consideration because many treat this passage as if it boiled down to let us teach you concerning the rapture or let us teach you about the rapture. Folks, this is horrid exegesis. And I encourage you to run from any teacher that uses this kind of sloppy grammatical analysis in their teaching. Now, the second point that we need to understand in our grammatical analysis of this passage is that the preposition is huper, not peri. In the phrase, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord, the word translated by is the Greek preposition huper. Huper normally means on behalf of, on account of, for the sake of, or simply for. Peri is normally translated about, regarding, or concerning. These two prepositions should never be confused. Huper with the genitive normally gives the motive, the aim, or the ground for an action. That action can be a sacrifice, can be an offering, can be a petition, can be a prayer, can be an argument in court, it can be the giving of a law, it can be waging war, it can be fighting a battle, it can be swearing, it can be making a vow. Whatever the action is, the huper clause is going to give the aim, or the benefacted, or the ground. Now I've randomly selected some examples from well-known Koine authors which illustrate the use of huper. 
In Philo on Special Laws 1.57, it's used where we read, For the honor of God. In Philo on Special Laws 2.3, we read, For profit. In Philo Embassy to Caius 2.42, we read, Not for gain, but for godliness. In Plutarch Publicola 2.2, we read, For freedom. In Plutarch Solon 18.6, we read, On behalf of those who suffered terribly. In Irenaeus Against Heresies 1.2, we read, Christ Jesus, the Son of God, who was incarnated for our salvation. Now, if we translated who pair in this passage with as if it were parry, it would, it would yield nonsense. Folks, about our salvation in this context is intellectual drivel. It makes no sense whatsoever. In Josephus against Appian, 2.142, we read, Appian, therefore, was blind in his mind when he contrived on Egypt's behalf to revile us. Were we to translate who pair here as if it were Perry, it would be utter nonsense. He would be reviling to the Jews about or concerning the Egyptians, which is absolutely not what the passage says. But if we translate this with the natural translation patterns for who pair, we read, revile the Jews on behalf of the Egyptians, or revile the Jews for the Egyptians. Now these uses, which were randomly selected, I could have gathered any of hundreds of other examples, these uses illustrate that 2 Thessalonians 2.1 with its who pair clause, is used well within the range of the common uses of clauses in Koine Greek. There's no grammatical or contextual reason to reject the standard translation paradigm of who pair. There's no grammatical or contextual reason to translate who pair as if it were pairing. Now our third grammatical observation is that the passage we are examining is a run-of-the-mill Greek petition. There is nothing odd, unique, unusual, extraordinary, or rare going on. Now, verbs of petition come in three basic forms. You can have a petition verb with a request clause alone. You can have a petition verb with a who pair clause alone. And you can have a petition verb that features both a request clause and a who pair clause. Now, the request clause is expressed in various ways. The three most common ways are to express it with an infinitive construction, for example, to go to war, or to express it with a purpose clause, that is a that clause, for example, that they might march, or a simple accusative, which is a direct object, for example, to pray for funds or to ask for funds. But you can also see constructions that express the request with a conditional clause, that is, an if clause. For example, we read in Josephus, he asked him if he could be an ambassador. This is found in Josephus's Antiquities of the Jews, 12.163. The Huper clause can give us the request itself, for example, to pray for peace. This is common when the Huper clause stands alone. But when the Huper clause appears with a request clause, it performs one of three basic functions. First of all, it can give us the party that benefits from the request. For example, on behalf of the Jews. This example comes from Josephus Antiquities of the Jews 20.195. It can also give us the aim of the request. For example, for the land not to be burned. This is found in Josephus Antiquities of the Jews 14.81. It can also give us the ground or reason for the request. For example, on account of the rapture, which we read here in our own text, 2 Thessalonians 2.1. Now, the petition in 2 Thessalonians 2.1 and 2 features both the request clause and who pair clause, and this raises the question, how do we translate such constructions? 
For the sake of illustration and clarification, I'm going to give you here three examples from Koine Greek, which feature both a request clause and a hupere clause. And all three kinds of hupere clauses are going to be represented. First of all, let's examine an example with the benefited party. In Josephus' Antiquities of the Jews, 20.195, we read, This was granted to gratify Papia, Nero's wife, who was a religious woman and had requested these favors from Nero on behalf of the Jews. Let's look at an example where the Hupere Clause gives us the aim of the request. In Josephus' Antiquities of the Jews, 3.310, we read, Moses and Aaron fell on the ground and besought God, not for their own deliverance, but that he would put a stop to what the people were unwarily doing. And now let's examine an example that where the Hupere Clause is used for the ground or reason of the request. Our example comes from Plutarch Tiberius et Gaius Gracchus, 9.6. The imperators, with lying lips, encouraged the soldiers in battle to repel their enemies for the sake of tombs and shrines. Now, when we compare the petition in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 and 2 with the petitions in Koine Greek that feature both request clause and a hupere clause, we see that this passage is just a run-of-the-mill example of a petition. Now, the request verb in this passage is erotau. It's a common verb. It's, there's nothing funky going on here. The request is couched with an infinitive construction. Again, this is very common. There's nothing unusual going on. And the Hupere clause gives us the ground or reason for the request. This is just plain vanilla Koine Greek. So once again, let me highlight the correct translation and understanding of the passage. We beseech you, brethren, on account of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together unto him, which is the rapture, not to be soon shaken in mind that the day of the Lord is at hand. This clearly distinguishes the rapture and the day of the Lord. The rapture is given as the reason why we don't need to worry about the day of the Lord. Folks, I want to encourage you to beware of pseudo-scholarship on this passage. The modern translations translate who pair here as if it were peri, and they'll translate it by regarding, concerning, or something of the like. And the modern commentaries regularly defend this shoddy translation. They defend it with bogus assertions that there no regular sense of who pair fits here. They defend it with shallow arguments and straw men. But they never defend their position on this passage with examples of request verbs with who pair clauses from Koine Greek. They never prove that there are examples where peri translations are absolutely necessary to make sense in a who pair clause with a verb of petition. And the fact is, they can't prove this point, and they won't prove this point. Folks, after 40 years of reading this stuff, this opposition to the pre-trib rapture in this passage, I have been forced to conclude that the primary reason for such translations and such commentary treatments is simply intellectual prejudice against the pre-tribulation rapture. They get their Greek in this passage from their doctrine, and then they grasp after straws to defend their anti-pre-trib translations and interpretations. But they give us nothing substantial to defend their point. Folks, there is zero ground for departing in 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 2 from the common translation patterns for verbs of petition with who pair clauses. You can translate and interpret this petition exactly the same way that we translate petitions in Pol Polybius, Philo, Plutarch, Josephus, Diodorus, Siculus, and the early church fathers. Now, it is an interesting observation that it is the Greek of this passage that convinced J.N. Darby of the pre-trib rapture. But let's back up for a little backstory. 
We frequently hear that Jan Darby got his pre-tribulation rapture teaching in 1830 from a young woman by the name of Margaret MacDonald, who was a Pentecostal, who got a pre-tribulation rapture doctrine supposedly through a prophecy given to her through a lying spirit, pretending to be the Holy Spirit. But folks, this story is impossible. It is deplorable fiction. There's two serious problems with this theory. First of all, there's a timing difference. Darby conceived his rapture teaching in 1827, three years prior to Margaret MacDonald's supposed rapture revelation in 1830. And there's also a major difference in the rapture teaching. Margaret MacDonald's rapture, indeed the rapture teaching of the entire Irvingite movement, followed three and a half years of tribulation and it preceded a short period of wrath. This rapture position for all practical purposes is a pre-wrath rapture. Well, Darby's rapture position preceded the entire 70th week. There's no way under the sun that Darby got his rapture teaching from Margaret MacDonald. And anyone that pushes that theory is pushing a bold-faced lie from hell. So how did Darby get his rapture view? Well, he may have gotten the seed idea from a book or from a man, because the fact is the pre-tribulation rapture was broached many times in the prior 200 years by godly men of the word. If you read William Watson's Dispensationalism Before Darby, you will find out that many held that position and articulated that position long before Darby. Now when we turn to Darby himself, he claims that he was convinced of the pre-tribulation rapture by the Greek of the very passage before us. He writes, it is true that who pair in certain cases signifies as or concerning. That is, that it is almost the same sense as parry. But it is unquestionable that when it is employed with words of prayer request, its regular meaning in Greek is by, for the sake of. No person who is at all familiar with the Greek tongue or who is willing to take the trouble of using a good dictionary would deny it. It is this passage which, 20 years ago, made me understand the rapture of the saints before, perhaps a considerable time before, the day of the Lord, that is, before the judgment of the living. This is found in the collected writings of J.N. Darby, volume 11, page 67. Now, the translation history of this passage is also fascinating. Because prior to the rise of the pre-tribulation rapture controversy, the translations appear to have consistently followed the standard translation protocols for requests with a who pair clause. For instance, the Wycliffe Bible in 1382, Tyndale in 1534, the Geneva Bible in 1560, the Bishop's Bible in 1568, and many others all present by, which is the very same rendering we have in the King James Version. And the early German Bibles followed the same track. Luther in 1545 offered Halben, and the Mentel Bible in 1466 offered Durch. But after the rise of the pre-tribulation rapture controversy, the translations began voiding the clear distinction between the rapture and the day of the Lord in this passage, by replacing the usual translation of who pair clauses with petitions with a translation that translates who pair as if it were parry, and it basically ignores the relationship that that phrase has to a petition. And this gives a radically different sense. So as we wind up, let me offer a clarification and a challenge. First of all, the clarification. Hopefully nobody misinterprets this video and falsely accuses me of saying that who pair and parry never overlap in usage and meaning. I am not saying that. I am merely saying that in instances involving who pair clauses with verbs of request, that you will be hard pressed to find a single example in classical or Koine Greek that departs from the treatment I explained above. 
Now, if you disagree with my handling of the Greek in this passage, please take it upon yourself to prove from the vast body of Greek literature that translating who pair with petitions as if it were peri is legitimate and common in Koine Greek. But I suspect that if you undertake this, you will find out that you can't, and therefore you won't. In conclusion, if you let verses 1 and 2 be the commonplace request that it is, with Huper having its usual force in requests, then this verse is a powerful argument for the pre-tribulation rapture. Let's revisit my paraphrase. I beseech you, brethren, on account of our gathering to the Lord in the clouds, not to worry about the day of the Lord. We are going up, not through.